So let's move forward in this. Let's talk about some of the diseases caused by copper deficiency. Well, probably one of the most common is right here, neuropathy. You know, numbness and tingling in hands, feet, burning pain in the hands or feet. These are, you know, I shouldn't say feet. I should say feet. Um, neuropathy. So again, numbness and tingling in the hands and feet are a common cause of neuropathy. But there are other forms of neuropathy. Some people develop like a vertigo type of neuropathy or a loss of gait, loss of balance in their gait type of neuropathy. Still neuropathy. Just the same. Myelopathy refers to the spinal cord. Okay, so where we have the spinal cord um, demyelinating in certain areas, we can have the neurological message that the spinal cord is distributing to the body or taking information from the body back to the brain. This myelopathy can occur with co copper deficiency. And then we have heart disease. There, there's some research studies that show copper deficiency causes heart disease. There's several reasons why. One of them is copper helps regulate iron. Um, and too much iron, iron can be oxidative and contribute to free radicals. And free radicals cause inflammation and increase the risk for the development of heart disease. But the other thing here is that copper runs an enzyme system in the body called superoxide dismutase. You ever heard the term SOD? SOD. We put this stuff in some of our supplements on purpose because it's a very powerful antioxidant. It's a very natural, very powerful antioxidant. And copper helps, again, copper drives the system, whereas SOD is like a car. Copper is like the key that starts the SOD car inside your body. So it helps regulate the free radical and oxidative damage. So it has a heart protective effect, uh, but it also regulates iron and that in and of itself with iron. Remember, if you have too much iron, that can contribute to heart disease. We also know there's some studies that show that copper deficiency can contribute to cognitive decline. So dementia, right? And this goes back to some of its functions within the brain. Remember, big functions. One is it helps to produce the myelin sheath, the coating around the nerve. The other is that it is necessary to help in the production of dopamine, which is a very important neurotransmitter. There's also some evidence that shows that, um, that it's actually more than just copper deficiency causing uh, Alzheimer's disease. It has to do with copper and zinc and aluminum these kind of all compete with each other. So what happens sometimes is aluminum toxicity will create copper issues. And those copper issues caused by aluminum toxicity can lead to a slow decline in, in uh, cognitive function. And then there's a condition called aceruloplasmonemia, which is where a person's not producing enough of this protein right here, ceruloplasmin is a protein that we produce. And this protein carries copper. It's actually how the body distributes copper. Copper generally doesn't tend to float by itself through your bloodstream. It floats attached to this protein because copper also, just like iron is oxidative, copper is oxidative. And so that protein ceruloplasmin um, prevents the copper from damaging your body as it's traveling through your bloodstream to get to the different tissues and organs where it can then be distributed and, and do its function. There's also a, ser a series of diseases called prion diseases. Um, if you've ever heard of mad cows, this is an example of prions or Kru Jake, uh, Jake uh, Crutchfield disorder, but prion diseases um, are disorders of the brain. And predominantly, we're starting to see more of this in humans. There, there is mad cow's disease, but humans generally don't tend to develop that. But prion diseases are one that we know copper can contribute to. Osteoporosis, I think we've mentioned that now a couple of times, so we'll keep belaboring that one. And then bone marrow dysplasia. Why is that important? Um, white blood cells, red blood cells... and platelets all come from your bone marrow. There's a specialized type of stem cell in your bone marrow, and these stem cells 
they produce blood elements, white, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And they, they do this in large part under the influence of copper. And so this is one of the reasons why copper deficiency can cause low white counts, low platelets. It can also cause low red, red blood cells. But even also beyond that, let's make some room over here. Copper, uh, one of the things I haven't really mentioned is that copper um, deficiency can also cause anemia because you need copper to form or helps to form hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein circulating in your blood that carries oxygen, right? And if you have lowered oxygen, that's generally, um, if it's ca being caused by either low red blood cell counts or low hemoglobin, low ability to carry that oxygen, that can lead to anemia, but low oxygen can create all kinds of issues, muscle pain, brain fog, weakness, shortness of breath. Like these are all potential ways that copper deficiency anemia can, you know, actually mimic or mask an iron deficiency anemia. You need both copper and iron to form that hemoglobin. So very, very important in terms of function. And so just anemia, we can add that to this list of disease. Uh, that copper deficiency can cause or contribute to. Now, let's talk a little bit about food. Um, you can see here lots of different food options, oysters, salmon, cashews, mushrooms, uh, leafy greens like spinach, avocado, pumpkin seed, walnuts, sunflower seeds, squashes, asparagus, olives, seaweed, squash, papaya, pear, garlic. What's not on this list, cabbage on this list, beets on this list. What's not on this list, a really good source of copper is liver or other organ meats. So if you, if you ever get an option to eat a adrenal gland on the kidney or liver, these are also uh, tissues that are very, very rich in copper. So those things can be consumed if you're trying to get copper through your diet. Interestingly enough, you may be eating these things. Um, current research shows that when we look at the average, oops, let's change the color here. Uh, when we look at the average American diet, about 50% of the U.S. RDA, that stands for recommend, Recommended Daily Allowance, is achieved through diet in the diet of the average person. So when, when researchers look at diets of uh, citizens of the United States, what they find is most of them only supply about 50% of the US RDA of, of copper. So m most of the time, you, you, you could say that people don't eat adequate quantities of copper. Now, if you go back to that list, a lot of those sources of copper, really solid sources, aside from organ meat and certain uh, things like salmon, were largely plant-based vegetarian based and this is something a lot of people don't eat today i mean most people you know the average american household they're eating fast food they're eating junk food they're eating processed food they're not eating fresh whole organically produced food and so they're not getting the quantity of copper and remember got to understand that the rda the recommended daily allowance this value is really based on um, what it takes to keep people out of severe deficiency. So in my opinion, the RDA probably even for many is, is probably a little bit too low. The government just tries to do a, a good job to say, okay, everybody should get at least this quantity on a daily basis. And again, based on that number, 50% um, 50 of daily copper is achieved by most Americans, not enough. In essence, people don't eat enough copper in their diet. So it's very important that if you have any of the symptoms, diseases, or things that we've talked about tonight that you ask your doctor to test. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.